But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. And he said, Come, see the place where he lay. And quickly go tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. Indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word to say to them, to tell his disciples, Behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice. So they came and held him by the feet. And this is it. They worshipped him. So this morning there's great rejoicing for us. And I wonder, what have you gone out to see? I've looked on Facebook this morning and it's all full of selling stuff, gadgets, tools, all kinds of selling stuff, selling pages, and very little about he has risen. So what are we looking for this morning? Well, these were looking for a certain thing. They were looking for a corpse. They were looking for a dead body. They were going to a tomb, but they met an angel who said, he's not here. He's not here. He's risen. And this morning, maybe we were looking for this, that, and the other, but the great hope for the church is that Jesus is alive, that he's risen from the dead. Not just risen, fantastic that is, he's ascended, and he's glorified, and the scripture says he's seated at the right hand of the Father, and with a wonderful promise that he's coming back again. What are we looking for this morning? Well, I'm looking to Jesus. I'm going to worship him. I want to hold on to him like these did, rejoicing. Hallelujah. What, what, what darkness there is at the moment with the COVID, but what hope we have in the risen Christ this morning. So let's pray. Lord, thank you this morning for this lovely service. Thank you this morning. We're going to rejoice in you. We've got this wonderful hope, Lord, that the world hasn't got, that, Lord, you are alive. That, Lord, there's no other religion that can have this wonderful hope. Even today, it's crossed out. It's put aside. There are all the liberals who don't want it because, Lord, it's a positive message. Lord, it beats Islam. It beats Buddhism, because this, our Saviour is alive. You've risen, you're glorified, and you're coming again, Lord Jesus. So bless this service. Let us have a good time in worshipping you, Lord. Let us rejoice greatly in our salvation this morning. Amen.
we can rejoice those wonderful words that say it is finished you accomplished what no other could and three days later sealed certified by your resurrection our king of kings our lord of lords risen and alive forevermore and our hearts are filled with such hope this morning thank you lord such love such love such love is this for me such love such love such love is this for me Take it in 
when Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and let proclaim my God how great thou art yeah so we thank you this morning it didn't end with the ascension your resurrection one day you are returning for your bride and your people will be found in your presence for eternity Lord what hope fills our heart this morning as we declare how great how great thou art sing that again when Christ shall come when Christ shall come with shouts of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God how you made that one and that shoot my soul
debt is paid it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled now the curse of sin has no hold on me whom the Son sets free always free
Father, we thank you this morning that you are indeed risen from the dead. Thank you, Lord Jesus, you, you are risen and ascended and glorified. And thank you for your word this morning to us. And as Scott brings it now, we ask you to bless him, use him, speak through him, Lord. And may we have some fresh, something fresh this morning from what Scott brings in Jesus' name. Pray, pray you bless the Sunday school. Pray you'll be with them, Lord, as they learn about you, Lord, this morning. Bless Sam and Vicky as they lead them there in that Sunday school, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Scotty boy. Resurrection. What a fantastic morning. What a Sunday. What a glorious Sunday. There has been and never will be a Sunday quite like the Resurrection Sunday. Today is the day as we as believers, we celebrate this wonderful historical thing that happened all those many years ago. And it's something we should actually think about more often than just one day a year because it's such a life changing event for us as believers. Now the central theme for every believer around the world today is the cross. And the cross should be centre stage. And I by no means want to take away from the cross this morning. It's a miraculous, wonderful work. This is the same cross where God who so loved the world sent his only son to die on it for the sins of the world. The same cross that the arms of Jesus spread his arms wide across. The same cross where his arms spread where well, ours should have been. The same cross, the same vile, detestable form of torture that became the symbol of peace between man and God. Yes, this cross should be the central theme for every believer around the world today. Evangelists, preachers, teachers of the word. However, this center stage is only one part of a bigger plan. And he shares with another event and that's what we're looking at this morning, the resurrection. It's fair to say this planet has seen many catastrophic events <laughs> throughout the timeline of this world. And it's altered the world for good, for bad. And the latest one to grace the timeline of our planet is obviously what we're in now. Everybody in here is wearing masks because of the COVID pandemic. And despite all these world-changing events... There has never been an event in the history of this planet quite like the history of the Passion Week. The Passion Week would reach its finale on the Sunday. The Sunday that all week was coming. The Sunday that would crown the finished work of Christ with such authority. And that's called the resurrection this morning. But why? Why is it so life-changing? Why is it so important? What are the implications for the reality of the resurrection? Well, I was chatting with someone at work this week about it. Uh, someone I know came up and said, Scott, meet this person. He's an atheist. <laughs> I said, well, what's his name? And he says, well, what's your name? <laughs> I said, okay, then, fantastic. So ensued a, a very long debate <laughs> about the resurrection. And as we was talking about the resurrection, I was talking about Jesus. I said to him, I said, prove to me your atheism. And he stuttered. He said, ooh, uh, uh, well, how do you do that? So I don't know, but I've just spent two hours proving to you Jesus is real and he's risen and ascended and alive. And it all came from 1 Corinthians 15. It was the thing that was going through my head the whole time. So if you've got Bibles this morning, turn to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12 to 19. And he says, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? There is no resurrection of the dead, and not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. Only for this life we have hope in Christ. We are of all people most to be pitied. That's from the NIV this morning. So Paul starts off 1 Corinthians by saying they preach Christ crucified as a stumbling block to confuse the wise. So you can imagine construction site, lots of builders, plumbers, electricians. I'm turning around and telling them all Jesus is alive. <laughs> you know, it would confuse the wisest of people. 
Paul says. And it definitely threw them off balance. By earthly standard, this will confuse the wisest of people. So Paul then starts to wrap up his first letter to Corinthians with the resurrection. He starts with it, he finishes with it. And what it would mean if Jesus hadn't rose from the dead. And this is why we need to rejoice, as we have been this morning. Because for us, the believer, Jesus' resurrection happened. I remember watching a YouTube video a few weeks ago where a pastor from a church in America said that the creation story was just a fable. This was a pastor running a church, said the creation story was a fable. He was then challenged by a theologian who said, okay, very respectfully, he said, okay. He said, what about the virgin birth? And he said, oh, I, don't, I can't really see that happening. He said, okay, you are a practicing pastor in a church. What's your denomination? He said, well, I'm evangelical. He said, okay. So what about Jesus' resurrection then? He said, not a chance. And that, honestly, I kid you not, it's on YouTube, that is the state of the modern church. We're drifting away from key teachings, key theological doctrines that will ground the believer. We have started doing it. Paul's been uh, running, started to run this discipleship course on a Thursday. And this is the things that people are coming away from. And the detriment to that person is they have no salvation. They are still in their sins. And this is why Paul is defending the resurrection. If Jesus hadn't rose from the dead, then his preaching of Christ would be senseless. Faith in Christ would be useless. All witnesses and preachers of the resurrection would be liars. And most importantly, no one would be redeemed from sin. That is crucial. That is not a nice word, sin. Redemption is an even more wonderful word to be saying this morning. And these are the things I was discussing with this chap this week. So the first thing we were saying that, well, if the resurrection hadn't happened, then I'm wasting my time. And you're wasting your time trying to argue with me. Because it's just pointless. Better things to do. So, but the fact is, it has happened. If Christ hadn't been raised from the dead, everything that we teach, everything we believe would be pointless. Because Christ wouldn't really be who he said he is. Now the Old Testament, the same person said that, that was, there's no need for the Old Testament. By his teaching, there's obviously no need for the New Testament either. Um, the Old Testament has many prophecies, and most of these point to the saving work of Christ and the circumstances surrounding these, from his birth, his birthplace, his journey, right up to his death, the manner of it, and also the resurrection. Psalm 16, 9 to 11 says, Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, but let your Holy One see in the psalm, Old Testament, prophetic about what would happen when Jesus went to the grave. He wouldn't be left there. He would rise again. Job 19, 23 to 27. Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. And they were. Oh, that with an iron pen and lead they were engraved in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see God. We sang about the second coming this morning because we will be physically in the presence of the King of Kings one day. Not only was this prophetic about Jesus' resurrection, it's also prophetic about us being with him physically for eternity. You see, the resurrection of Jesus is the official stamp of approval, not only Jesus' ministry, but also his authority on the integrity of his nature and character. So because he did rise from the dead, we can trust in who he is. Trust in his promises. Trust he is deity, fully God as much as he is fully man. Now this also means that we can say faith in Christ is not useless. <clears throat> it's actually well founded. So because of his resurrection, we can actually trust Jesus absolutely above things. All things, not just slightly, or when we feel like it, or when we need it. We can have absolute trust in him at all times. So here is someone we can trust in, we can count on, depend on. Someone who's proven his authority is above all things, even death itself. Someone who is truly faithful and worth 
putting our faith in. Even now, during this crazy pandemic, Jesus is just as faithful now as he ever was. He said he would be with us to the very end of the age. And when the end of the age comes, we will be with him physically in his presence. 1 John 5, 5 says, Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? To declare he is the Son of God, to believe, means we not only trust in his death, we declare, we believe, and we trust in his resurrection this morning. I have a very dry throat. All the witnesses and preachers of the resurrection would be liars. This is something else that we talked about, because... There are a lot of theologies and doctrines out there, and a lot of people say, oh, we don't need doctrine, but you do. As much as a boat needs a keel and a rudder and a sail, the Christian needs theology and doctrine. It needs foundational teaching. The preachers of the resurrection had this foundation in the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus made many post-resurrection appearances. He came to the disciples multiple times and even appeared to more than 500 people at once. That's in 1 Corinthians 15, 3-9 if you want to look. It's critical to know that most of the people who Jesus supposedly appeared to were still alive as his story was being circulated. This means that they were available to deny or corroborate this resurrection tale. They were available for comment. <laughs> If Jesus didn't come back from the dead, that means that the apostles were all lies and that they were part of the most elaborate conspiracy in history. This isn't my word. This is actually investigative reporters like Lee Strobel. Oh, the other chap, his name's going my brain. Anyway, find him on Amazon. Another available book, sellers. <laughs> but they have used their skills as investigative journalists to prove, set out to disprove, and in doing so, they proved the resurrection was not this elaborate conspiracy. It was actually real. Every single person had to be on the hoax. They had to stick to the story under threat of death. Even when denying it would save them from execution. As Paul says, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. But again, historical value outside of the Bible, outside of the Christian circle, backed up the reality of this growing movement. People in old day Turkey, Constantinople, did well there. <laughs> they actually commented. They commented on this growing movement that was coming out of Israel. That there was something real to it because it spread a wildfire through the known world. This is historical value. If there was some substance, some reality, really gritty truth behind it to back it up and there was, then it's in the evidence that 2,000 years later, the name above all names is still the most popular and famous name above all names, and that's the name of Jesus. When people use his name in vain, they will conjure up the same image as every person that doesn't use his name in vain. A guy with long hair, beard, son of God, cross. There is such power in his name. 2,000 years later, it is still the name above all names. This validates all when we declare this morning, each and every morning that we meet together, when we share the gospel in our daily lives, that the resurrection really did happen. Finally, the most important one, no one would be redeemed from sin. Romans 4.20 says, No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. Context, this is Abraham. But also, it's for us as believers. We have to not waver and trust in the promises of God. We remember on Good Friday, this wonderful thing that happened, where Jesus was on the cross, which is not wonderful, it was horrendous and, and vile, and I can't even begin to grasp what he went through. But there was a moment, a wonderful, beautiful moment, where the veil from top to bottom was torn in two. When Jesus cried, it was finished. The veil was torn. This indicated not only was the work done by God, but it was now an open invitation to be in his presence. Sin no longer separates us from the Father. We have access through the precious blood of Christ. It was a public announcement that God was fully satisfied with the sacrificial death 
of his son. The writer of Hebrew actually confirms this. That God was pleased with the offering in Hebrews 2.9. Where he says, but we see Jesus who was made lower than the angels for a little while. Now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. So that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Romans 4, 24, 25 says, It will be counted to us who believed in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Big words. <laughs> we joke about it in house group. But these are wonderful, life-changing words. And there's reality because of the resurrection. The resurrection was a public approval of the completed work and a signal to all the world that through the resurrection we can be found justified. We can be found forgiven. We can be looked upon as though we had never sinned by our Father now through the righteousness of Christ and not our own. There are so many people in this world that are content, fully believe that when we make our final curtain call in this life, we just become worm food. We become nothing. We disappear into nothingness. We are just stardust bouncing around this universe with no purpose, no plan. We cease to exist. And all that's left behind is memories on a stone plaque that says, here he began and here he ends. That for me is a sad, sad existence. And it doesn't make me angry that people think this. It doesn't make me angry that people doubt the validity of Christ. But it makes me sad for that person. That they will go through their life doing all that they are doing to achieve nothing. And they're content that there is nothing in this life. And that makes me sad when I speak to these people. But praise God that is not the case. Praise God that Jesus conquered the grave. For his resurrection assures me above all things of the great hope that is my inheritance. A great hope that says, he has risen, so will I. As he has physically risen, so will I. Death is not the end. Paul said a few years ago, but the gateway to eternal life. It was when he first joined the church. Never forgot that. Philippians 3.10 That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Revelation 21.4. Wonderful scripture. The one I always go to. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. I would say this is a living hope. This isn't dead in the ground. It isn't something I hope will happen in that way. It's a living hope that says it's going to happen and I cannot wait to be in his presence. I will be in the presence of the living, breathing, risen, grave, conquering Savior, our Messiah, our King, Jesus. So the empty tomb, for me this morning, means a living hope. An empty tomb signifies ultimate victory. So to finish with, the resurrection assures us of so many things this morning. It's a crucial teaching. It's only that we need to keep coming back to week in, week out, because it's why we are here. It assures us of who our Savior is. As I said before, the integrity of his character, his word, and deity. It assures us of our forgiveness. This morning, I don't hope I'm forgiven. I know I'm forgiven. I don't deserve it. But it's by grace and grace alone that I have been justified through Christ this morning. It's through Christ's resurrection this morning, justification, reconciliation, sanctification are words we can apply into our lives. If you want to know more, join our Thursday hours group and we'll talk about them. And for those who have gone before us, that was a right cheap plug on here. <laughs> those who have gone before us as forerunners of the faith, family members included, we know where they are. We know that, that where they are going, and that is our living hope. All because of the resurrection. All because of my king defying nature, defying naysayers, and proving he truly is the king of kings in the name above all names. So this morning, we remember the resurrection, and it's important. And why daily we should remember it and rejoice and walk in the resurrection life. It's not just a saying. It's not just a clever 
sounding word. To walk in resurrection life is to walk knowing we are forgiven. We are not condemned anymore. Yes, there is one that seeks and prowls to run us down. But your past is covered at the cross. This is exciting news that we were once sinners separated from the Father. Jesus on Good Friday came and he died on the cross, willingly giving up his life for us, for you, for the world over, that we could find forgiveness through his death. We can find a living hope through his resurrection this morning. If you do not know Jesus, if you do not have this living hope, then you simply repent, turn to Jesus, trust in him as your saviour. Believe in his resurrection and see what wonderful things he will do in your life. If you have the opportunity this week to share the gospel, share it, declare it, rejoice in it. Let's not be weary and dreary about it. Yes, Jesus died on the cross. He's alive. <laughs> we should be declaring it to the world this day. So, resurrection. Is it important? Fantastic. My job is done. <laughs> yeah, what a fantastic word, Scott. Brilliant. And he's really hugging that thirsty disciple she's got in. Every opportunity. Oh. Get into it, he's really good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Scott read this passage just before we pray. And he says, it said, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. And then there's a little word. But. Say but. But. Say it as if you mean it. But. Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So you get like, oh yeah, we're to be pitied if it's like that. And then he goes, but guess what? He has been raised from the dead. Glory to God, the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. That's why what, what Scott was saying this morning is so important. You can have hope in the resurrection of the dead, which includes you when you have accepted Christ. If you don't know that this morning, as Scott was saying, if you don't know that you've been accepted by Christ or that you've accepted him into your life, Please deal with it this morning on Resurrection Morning. Get to know it so that you can have that assurance. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for that brilliant word and we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for those testimonies of, of real life, eyewitness testimonies of people who knew that you were resurrected from the dead. And we want to thank you this morning that as a result of that, we can have confidence in eternal life. Lord, we just give you praise this morning for your resurrection and for what it means to us. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turn to heaven, spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope. And hallelujah, praise the one who set me free, hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me You have broken every chain There's salvation in your name Jesus Christ, my living hope Who could imagine so great a mercy? Oh, our heart could fathom 
such a boundless grace to the God of ages step down from glory to where my sin I'm bear my shame the cross has spoken I am forgiven the King of moment this morning to reflect on the truth of what we're singing hallelujah praise the one who set me free do we believe that this morning do we believe that we have been set free yes yes do we believe that death has lost his grip on us death has been overcome by our king the bible says we are to rejoice over these things shall we be happier <laughs> well, let's declare this morning wonderful truth sealed in the resurrection then came the morning that sealed the promise your very body began to breathe now of the silence the roaring lion Declared the grave has no claim. And came the morning, and sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. Out of the sound. Oh, 
Well, death is beaten, you have rescued me. Sing it out, Jesus is alive. The empty cross, the empty grave. Life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive. He's alive. Glorious day, what a glorious way.